Irrespective of whether it's praised or damned, few inventions have had such an effect on human relations as the telephone, which appeared on the scene less than 150 years ago. This truly revolutionary invention was primarily the work of Alexander Graham Bell. Born in Scotland, at the age of 23, Bell went to live in Boston to teach speech to the deaf. Together with his assistant, Thomas A. Watson, Bell also studied the characteristics of sound. The two men wanted to use electric current for transmitting speech. In 1875, they perfected the original model of their telephone. It made both men famous and earned Bell a fortune. Yet he never ignored the fact that the true credit for his invention belonged to someone else. Johann Philipp Reis devised his telephone 15 years before Bell, but no one really took him seriously. Reis, a teacher and physicist from Friedrichsdorf near Frankfurt in Germany, was obsessed with the notion of simulating the function of the human ear with electric current. His artificial ear was carved from oak and had a hammer and anvil made of metal. This listening apparatus was connected up to a battery. When Rice spoke into it, it moved. This vibrating contact mechanism caused the strength of the electric current to vary. With this device, Rice was able to reproduce sounds at any distance he wanted. He'd invented the first electric telephone. Die Sonne ist von Kupfer. Die Sonne ist von in 1861, Rice presented a further development of his invention at the Physics Society in Frankfurt. To demonstrate it, he played the violin. With this device too, the strength of current was varied by a contact mechanism sensitive to sound. Unfortunately, the worthy physicists in Frankfurt weren't impressed. They regarded an apparatus that produced horribly distorted sounds as nothing more than a toy. Without backing, Rice couldn't manufacture his invention in large numbers. So the age of the telephone wasn't ushered in until several years later by Alexander Bell in Boston. Bell knew of Rice's studies, so he was aware of the theory that human speech could be transmitted by means of electricity and a mechanism which varied the strength of current according to the vibrations produced by the sound waves of the voice. On March the 7th, 1876, Alexander Bell was granted a patent for his telephone. He beat his greatest rival by the narrowest of margins. Elisha Gray, an inventor from Chicago, had arrived at the patent's office on the same day as Bell, but just two hours later. Two hours that cost him dear. For years, Gray fought Bell in the courts, until in the end he received a modest settlement. Bell had launched an out-and-out -out advertising campaign at lightning speed. His talking machine was the undisputed sensation at the American Centennial Exposition of 1876. Only one year later, the former speech instructor from Boston founded the Bell Telephone Company. Its concept was that telephones shouldn't be sold to customers, but merely rented out to them. This soon proved to be a brilliant idea, because for many years it gave Bell almost unlimited control of the American telephone system. Five Boston bankers made telephone history by linking up to form the world's first telephone network. The exchange was located at the Holmes Burglar Alarm Company. Shortly afterwards, Bell brought out the first telephone directories. Even a city like Boston had only a few dozen subscribers. But that soon changed. Three years after it was founded, the Bell Telephone Company already had 50,000 subscribers. 
Major telegraph firms like Western Union obtained licenses from Bell and entered the telephone business. Soon, cities themselves were linked by long-distance lines. The network grew and grew. The first coast-to-coast -coast telephone link in the United States was completed in 1914. The first transcontinental call was made by Alexander Bell himself. It only became possible to cover such distances when carbon granule microphones were used in the transmitter. Carbon granule microphones were in general use up until only a few years ago. Their big advantage is their high efficiency. The principle is simple. The sound waves of the voice cause the membrane of the microphone to vibrate. Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. As a result, an electrode on the underside of the membrane is pushed against a chamber filled with carbon granules. The pressure varies according to the vibrations. The electrical resistance fluctuates in the same rhythm. The current is modulated at different intensities and transmitted to the receiver. For a long time, earpieces were based on the principle of electromagnetism. The incoming current flows through the coils wound around a permanent magnet. The strength of the magnet fluctuates according to the strength of the electric current. This fluctuation causes a metal membrane to vibrate. The movement of the membrane is transferred to the air. The caller's voice becomes audible. Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. In the early days of this century, employees in telephone exchanges literally had their hands full. At first, this strenuous work was done mainly by boys. It wasn't until a few years later that telephone companies and post offices turned to the fairer sex, hoping no doubt that a female voice would be more likely to pacify callers irate at having to wait ages to be connected. We don't know whether this was the case or not. At any rate, many telephone companies soon switched to automatic exchanges. This meant the introduction of telephones with dials, a new experience for subscribers. The first telephone cable across the Atlantic was laid in 1956, a gigantic project. Stretching from Britain to Canada, it had a total length of 3,619 kilometers. The thick copper cable, with its repeaters, could transmit 36 calls simultaneously. Before the cable was lowered into the water, intercontinental voice communication had depended on radio links. The first radio link was established in 1920. Only once has the huge American telephone network fallen completely silent. That was for an entire minute on August the 6th, 1922, in memory of Alexander Graham Bell, who'd passed away two days earlier at the age of 75. 